Hey guys, this is Matt. Welcome back to my uh, six-week study that I'm doing for our men's group leading up to Easter. Um, this week's study, week two, is on assurance. And the question to be asked is, is God who he claims to be? We're going to start out in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-4. through 4. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through this, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. God's word is filled with promises that God makes with mankind. This allows us to join God with his will and what he is wanting to accomplish in this world. God's word shows us how to escape the evil that this world is filled with. God's word is like a blueprint for a builder or marching orders for a warrior. I mean, that's just, this is off subject here, but guys, that's just absolutely huge. Um, God wants to be a part of our lives, but our sin is what so often ties us up or allows us not to see and we wonder why bad things happen so many times but it's not because of what God's done I mean you look all the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve you know it wasn't what God did to destroy the garden of Eden it's why did man go away from God's plan and of course bad things are going to happen when you start doing things the way we're not supposed to do things anyway off subject we'll get back there's two different things between, or there, there's a difference between insurance and assurance. Insurance is a practice or agreement by which a company or government agency provides a guarantee of compensation for a specified loss, damage, illness, or death in return for a payment or premium. Assurance is a positive declaration intended to give confidence, a promise. It's completely possible to have assurance of your insurance, but that primarily rests on who your provider is. Faith is like an insurance policy on life, except the policy has already been paid and is just waiting for your assurance to approve the policy. Our assurance in Jesus grows as we are, I'm sorry, our assurance in Jesus grows as we are active in sharing our faith. We turn to Philemon chapter 1, because there's only one chapter, verse 6 says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. Moving on to Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. This is the war of man. Paul describes this just so well. Let me read this to you. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile towards God, to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. So Paul is talking about this whole idea of old versus new, slave versus free, self versus Jesus, human nature versus spirit filled. Moving to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to, and to act according to his good purpose. When we begin to follow God doing things his way, then naturally good things typically follow. 
It's it's our definition of the word good that makes this previous statement true. Part of becoming a Christian is surrender. And it's when we no longer live for our will, but God's will. When we submit our will, suffering becomes an honor. Just kind of expanding on that a bit off my notes here, guys. It's just that the way this world looks at success and the way this world looks at what is good is not going to be the same as Christians. Um, Jesus said, yeah, he will bless us with family. He'll bless us with homes and fields. But he also says that he's going to bless us with persecution. And that's something I've always struggled with because it's like part of me becoming a Christian. And I remember praying, asking God, I was like, hey, I, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to do with persecution. Like I struggle in that department. But God's been changing my heart more and more. And as Christians, when we learn to suffer well, it completely changes the ball game. Live a life like that shining star. How dark, I mean, I, I, I didn't read all the way. Let me read the verses 14 through 15 of Philippians as well. It says, Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, and a crooked and deprived generation, in which you will shine like stars in the universe. I said, live like, live a life like that, live a life like that shining star. How dark it must be in a vast space of our solar system. And to think of a star shining would just be breathtaking. This is how a Christian should look when standing next to non-Christians in the workplace, in line at the movie theater, out for dinner, or at your kids' baseball games. We are shining, we are shining to bring glory to God, not ourselves. It would be really easy to accept the wisdom that I pray and that I pray to God asking for and then use that wisdom to take advantage of my customers, making big profits. Every breath in our lungs is a gift from God, and pride just tries to convince us that it is that train I'm sorry to you about. Huh. Um, let me reread that. Every breath in our lungs is a gift from God, and pride just tries to convince us that it is us and not God that gives us that breath. God gives all of us gifts, talents, and abilities. This week, really think about what it would look like for you to really shine. As you shine, people will notice, and it's in these, why are you doing blank, that we have an opportunity to explain where our gifts come from. Fear and trembling. We naturally think that we are right and others have it wrong. So ask yourself the hard questions. Why do I believe what I believe? Why do I do the things that I do? What is my deepest desire? Romans chapter 7 verses 14 through 20. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, and what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not good. I, for what I do, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I want, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it but it is the sin living in me that does it. There is a real war raging inside Paul's head. This doesn't sound like a great Christian leader of the New Testament. It sounds more like a man struggling to find out who he really is. See, our assurance in Jesus grows the more we become dependent on him. But being independent is what America is all about. When we realize just 
how bad we when we realize how bad we are we really are we realize how much more that we need a savior and i think that's one of the biggest problems i had growing up is i didn't think i was a bad person and when you think that you got your life together and when you think you're a good moral citizen and you're a good person why would you need a savior but when you can finally realize that you're just a wretch you know, for me, when I went through my drug abuse and alcohol abuse, that's what was really something that opened me up, that I, I needed help. It wasn't that I wanted help. It wasn't that I could use help. I could use some improvement. No, I, I desperately needed change, and I couldn't do it on my own. And it really helped me connect the dots of what a Savior is all about. It's for saving. You don't, you're not drowning and just, uh, I'll think about getting out of the water. You know, no, when you're drowning, you'll do whatever it takes to get out of the water. And so many times I'll share the gospel to people and people will just be on the fence. And I just think of them struggling in the water and just being on the fence and being like, yeah, I think I'm just going to stay in here for a little bit longer as I can barely breathe and going in and out from underneath the water. See, many people want Jesus to save them. We see this upon many deathbeds, which started the phrase deathbed confession. Only a few people really want Jesus to be Lord of their life. And as I said this earlier, addiction made this very clear to me. Sin is our addiction as mankind. Just like addiction, sin latches onto us and just will not let go. To be free from addiction doesn't happen in 30 days. Maybe not even in a year. It happens when you can wake up day in and day out with joy and contentment in your heart. It takes time. Paul is teaching us that the Christian life is a lifelong wrestling match with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1-5 through 5. When I come to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except for Jesus and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and per persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Our assurance of salvation comes when we realize how needy we really are. When we look into the mirror and can barely recognize the person you see today, that's God moving and shaping your life. Your confidence comes from our your confidence comes from our faith in God, not self. When we think of ourselves as good people, we downplay our need for Jesus. Have you ever seen a starving person when you hand them food? This happened to our to our family in Kansas City a while back. There were many homeless people on our trip, and we tried to help them out when we could. Some of, them tucked, some of them would tuck away the food or the money and get it out of sight as they continued to ask for more. So that they, the, there was this one lady who burned a memory in our brains. When we handed her the entree we had, we had from Applebee's, she immediately started eating it, and she was very hungry. It was at that moment that we reached deeper into our pockets and gave that lady everything we could. You could tell that she needed, really needed our help. Likewise, we need to be the same way towards our Bible reading each morning, our prayer times, our gatherings, and our outreach. When we discover that we really need, discover that, that need for Jesus, our assurance will grow because it allows Jesus to do the impossible things right in front of us. Let me reread verses 4 and 5 of this. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but God's power. Don't worry about your words. Jesus wants to show up and take action. Show people God's power by explaining how impossible things in your life started happening. Jesus was a great storyteller, and his use of parables shows us his attempt to meet people on a level they will understand. People today want to see that God's real, 
that he's alive and well, living and active. In conclusion, Romans chapter 15, verses 5 through 8 reads, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and one mouth you may glorify the God, the Father of your Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. America has this kingship idea of leadership. The picture of the CEO up in the corner office overseeing a city, getting a message during the workday. Thousands of employees will get thousands of employees will get the grunt work done so that the CEO can handle the big picture problems. Jesus had a different idea of what leadership looked like. The people at the top were the ones who would serve others the greatest, meaning our CEOs would should be the ones on the assembly lines with busted knuckles and calloused hands. Real leaders don't ask to be served by others, but are looking to see who they can serve. Think about the change that would start in business if companies started adopting this idea of servant leadership. As we mature as men and Christians, the church, Everything will become more and more about the lost and less and less about you. I've seen several church splits over the years and have personally been a part of two. As a kid growing up, our splits were over music. People actually cared more about the style of songs we sang than they did the unity in reaching the lost. This was a truly heartbreaking experience for me. The mature Christian is the one who can step back and say, I am willing to do whatever it takes, shy of sinning, to reach the lost souls who don't know Jesus. So I ask you the question again, what is your deepest desire? Is it your preference or for more souls to enter the kingdom of God? One heart, one mind, one voice. And accepting the lost is what makes our church attractive to those outside the church walls. When people outside can see rich and poor, old and young, white and black, hymns and rock, they see unity. Unity is not a common thing in our culture. And church is what, in church and the church is what should lead the way showing our communities we do have the answer to the world's problems. The church needs to lead the way if we want to see a positive change in our community. We are not only the light of the world, but we are the example of for the world. This week, be the church and take some honest examination, take some honest examination time of where you need to mature and keep growing. Think of Paul, and if anyone had it, if anyone had it figured out, it would have been him. But even he had a battle raging within him. Guys, that's week two about the difference between assurance and insurance. Uh, next week, week three, is God's word, how God speaks to us. Thank you guys for watching. See you guys in next week.